Welcome back everyone to chapter 16 of Where the Red Fern Grows. We are going through these chapters. Um, I've said this plenty of times before, each chapter holds something exciting and um, new information. So chapter 15, which, what, which we read yesterday, covered that him, Billy, the main character, grandpa and father, had finally made it to the championship hunting campgrounds. They've experienced a few nights there. Billy has drew his card for the hunt and he picked the fourth night. Grandpa is going around, um, boosting about Billy, um, letting everyone know how well his dogs are. Um, and then uh, Billy entered little Anne into the um, best dog looking contest and she won, how exciting. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into chapter 16 of Where the Red Fern Grows. In the afternoon, our judge came over and introduced himself and told us he was going with us that night. Remember, every, uh, every person that goes out into the hunting for the coons, they have a judge go by with them. So there's nothing um, that maybe could disqualify them or no cheating, things like that. Okay, after sundown, we piled up in, we piled in our buggy and drove a few miles down river. I noticed other, other hunters doing the same thing. Everyone was trying to get away from the already hunted territory. Remember in chapter 15, dad said, how about we go a little bit further down river because uh, remember he has a fourth night and all the hunters already got in that area. Maybe the, the coons are spreading out because they know these hunters are coming. Keep all this in mind, okay, why we're reading. It was dark by the time Grandpa stopped. I untied the ropes of my dogs. Little Ann reared up on me and whined. Old Dan walked off a few yards, stretched his body and dragged his claws through the bottom soil. Opening his mouth, he let out one loud ball and then disappeared in the thick, in the thick timber. Little Ann was right by his knees, heels. We took off after them. Grandpa got nervous. He said to me, do you think you ought to whoop to them? I told him to wait a little while. They would be plenty of, whoop, of time for whooping. He snorted and said he thought, uh, he thought a hunter always whooped to his dogs. I do, Grandpa, I said, but not before they strike a, a trail. Why is Grandpa saying this? Why is Billy replying the way he is? Because Billy knows his dogs. Grandpa may have experience, but not with his own dogs. It's different when you're going out there and they're yours, okay? You're, you, you know them by now. We walked on, every now and then we would stop and listen. I could hear the loud snuffing of old Dan. Once we caught a glimpse of little Anne as she darted across an opening uh, that was bathed by the moonlight. She was as silent as a ghost and picked as quickly, she was, she was as silent as a ghost and as quick as a fleeting sh shadow. Grandpa said, it sure is a beauty night for hunting, the judge said. You can't beat these Ozark Mountains for the beauty. I don't care where you go. Grandpa started to say something. His voice was drowned by the, drowned out by the bell-like cry of little Anne. In a whisper, I said, come on, Dan, hurry and help her. As if in answer to my words, his deep hammered, he, his voice deep, his deep voice hammered its way up through the river bottoms. I felt the blood tingle in my veins. That wonderful feeling that only a hunter knows creeped over my body. Looking over at Grandpa, I said, now you can whoop. Jerking off his hat and throwing back his head, he let out a yell. It wasn't a whoop, it was a, or a screech. It was a halfway in between. Everyone laughed. The coon was running up river toward the campground. We turned and followed. I could tell by the, the, by the dog's voice that they were running side by side and were hot on a trail. Closing my eyes, I could almost see them running, body stretched to the fullest length, legs pounding up and down, white steam rolling from their hot breath in the frosty night, frosty night. Grandpa got tangled up in some underbush and lost his hat and spectacles. What are spectacles? Spectacles are glasses. It took us a while to find, find the glasses. Papa said something about getting them wired on, on, on with bailing wire. 
Grandpa snorted. The judge laughed. The coon crossed the river and ran upstream. Soon my dogs were out of the hearing distance. I told Papa we better stay on our side of the river and keep going until we could hear them again. 20 minutes later, we heard something coming back. We stopped. I think they have crossed back to our side, I said. All at once, the voices of my dogs were drowned by, out, drowned out by a loud roar. What in the world was that, Grandpa said. I don't know, the judge said. Reckon it was wind or thunder? About that time, we heard it again. The judge started laughing. I know now what it is, he said. Those hounds have run, run that coon right back to our camp. The noise we heard was the other hunters whooping to them. Everyone laughed. A few minutes later, I heard my dog's bawling, bawling tree. When on reaching the tree, Papa ran his hand back under his coat. He pulled out Grandpa's gun. That's a funny looking gun, the judge said. It's a 410 gauge pistol, isn't it? It's, it's the very thing for, the ki for this kind of work, Papa said. You shouldn't kill a coon with, with it if you tried. You couldn't kill a coon with it if you tried, especially if you're using birdshot. All it will do is sting his hind a little. At the crack of the gun, the coon gave out a loud squirrel and jumped. My dogs lost no time in killing him. We skinned the coon and soon we were on our way again. The next time my dogs treed, they were across the river from us. Finding a rifle, we pulled out our shoe, we pulled off our shoe and started across. Grandpa very gingerly started picking his way. His tender old feet moved from the soothed rock to another. Everything was fine until we reached the mid until we, meet, we reached midstream, where the current was much swifter. He stepped on a loose rock. It rolled and it rolled and down him and down he went. As the cold river water touched his body, he let out a yell that could have been heard for miles. He looked so funny we couldn't keep from laughing. Papa and the judge helped him to his feet. Laughing every step of the way, we finally reached the other side. Grandpa kept going in his wet clothes until we reached the tree where the dogs were. After killing the coon, we built a large fire so Grandpa could dry his clothes. He'd get up as close to the fire as he could, turn his way, and that. He looked so funny standing there with his long, with his long underwear steaming. I roll. I started rolling with laughter. <laughs> this is Grandpa we're talking about. Um, he looked over at me and snapped. What's so funny? I said, nothing. Well, why are you laughing? He said. At this remark, Papa and the judge laughed until their eyes watered. Mumbling and grumbling, Papa, Grandpa said, if you fellas were as cold as I am, you wouldn't be laughing. We knew we shouldn't be laughing, but we couldn't help ourselves. The judge looked at his watch. It's after three o'clock, he said. Do you think they'll tree another one? As if, as if to throw the words back in the judge's face, old Dan opened up. I stood up and whooped. Woo-wee, get him, Dan, get him. Put him up, put him up a little tree. There was a mad scramble. Grandpa tried to put his britches on back, try, tried to put his britches on backwards. The judge and Papa ran over to help him with his shoes. Each one tried to put a shoe on the wrong foot. I was laughing so hard I could do nothing. A hundred yards from the fire, I realized we had forgotten the coon skins. I ran back for them. My, jugs, my dogs had jumped the coon in swampland. He tore out of the river bottom, for, for the river bottom. I could tell they were close to him by how fast they were bawling. All at once, their, all at once, their baying stopped. We stood still and listened. Old Dan treed a few more times and then stopped. Grandpa asked, what happened? I told him the coons had probably pulled some kind of trick. Coming up, coming up to my dogs, we saw they had work. They had they were working up and down an old rail fence. We stood and watched. Every now and then, Old Dan would rear up a large hackleberry tree that was standing about seven feet from the fence and bald tree. As yet, little Ann had not bald the tree bark. We watched her. She was working everywhere. She climbed up on the rail fence and followed the zigzag course until she disappeared in the darkness. I told Papa I was sure the coon had walked the rail fence in some way had fooled my dogs. Old Dan, could keep, Old Dan would keep coming back to the hackleberry tree. He would rear up on it and ball tree. 
We walked to him, looking for looking the tree over. We could see that the coon wasn't in it. The judge said, it looks like he had them fooled. Maybe you had better called off. Call them off, Grandpa said. We can go someplace else to hunt. We've got we've we've gotten we've got to get more coons, even if I have even if I have to tree it myself. For some reason, no one laughed at his remark. It al it's almost daylight, Papa said. Yes, that's what has me worried, I said. We don't have time to go anymore. To go, we don't have time to do any more hunting. If we lose this one, we're beat. Hearing the words beat, Grandpa began to fidget. He asked me, what do you think happened? How do you think the, cool, the coon fooled them? I don't know for sure, I said. He walked that rail fence. The hackleberry tree has something to do with his trick, but I just don't know, son, the judge said. I wouldn't feel too badly if I were you. I've seen some of the very best hounds fooled by, the smart, by a smart old coon. Regardless of all the discouraging talk, the love, regardless of all the discouraging talk, the love and belief I had in my little red hounds never faltered. I could see them now and then leaping over old logs, tearing through the underbrush, sniffing and searching for the lost trail. My heart swelled with, with such with pride. I whooped, urging them on. In a low voice, the judge said, I'll say one thing, they don't give up easily. Birds began to chirp all around as the sky took on a little light gray color. Tiny dim stars were blinking in the night away. I, it looks like we're beat, Papa said, it's getting daylight. At that moment, a loud, clear voice of the red hound, hound, red bone hound bawling tree rang through the river bottoms. It was the voice of little Anne. Sucking, on the mount, mount, sucking in a mouthful of air, I held it. I could feel my heart pounding against my ribs. I closed my eyes tight, gritted my teeth to keep the tears from coming. Yeah, let's go get him, Grandpa said. No, wait a minute, I said. Why, he said. He asked, wait till old Dan gets there, I said. It's daylight now, and if we walk up to the tree, the coon will jump out. It's hard to keep a coon in the tree after daylight. Let's wait until old Dan gets there. Then if he jumps he won't have a chance he won't have a chance to get away that boy's right the judge said it's hard to keep a coon in a tree after daybreak just then we heard old dan his deep voice shattered the morning silence searching for the lost trail he came across the fence and worked his way out into the old field turning around he saw him coming it was a red blur in the gray morning shadows coming from the rail fence and without break without breaking his stride he raised his body into the air about halfway over and while still in the air he bawled hitting the ground with a loud grunt he ran past us everyone whooped to him ahead was a deep washout about 10 feet wide on the other side there was a crane break his long red body stretched to its fullest length seemed to float in the air as if he sailed over it we could hear only the the we could hear the tall stilts rattling as the plowed as he plowed his way through them. A bunch of sleepy snowbirds rose from the thick crane, cane, flittered over, and settled in a roll uh, on the old fence, old rail fence. Nearing the tree, we could see it was a it was a tall sycamore, and there, high in the in the top, was the coon. Grandpa threw a fit. He hopped around, whooping and hollering. He threw his whole old hat down on the ground and jumped on it up and down. Then he ran over and kissed little Anne right on her head. After we killed and skinned the coon, the judge said, let's walk back to the old fence. I think I know how the old fellow pulled this trick. Back to the fence, the judge stood and looked around for a few minutes smiling. He said, yes, that's how he did it. How, Grandpa said, asked. He's smiling, still smiling, the judge said. The old coon walked the rail fence, coming even, coming even with the hackleberry tree, he leaped on its side, climbed up. Notice how thick the timber is around here. See the limb way up there on the on in the in the top. This one is this the one that runs over and almost touches the sacramore. We saw what he meant. The coon walked out on the limb. He said, leaped over and caught a sacramore limb. Repeating this over and over the tr uh, from the tree to tree, he worked his way far out into the river bottoms. What I can't figure out is how the hounds found him. Gazing at little Ann, he shook his head and said, I've been hunting coons and, ju and judging coon hunts for 40 years, but I've never seen anything like that. He looked at me. Well, son, he said, you have tied the leading teams. 
there's only one more night of eliminations. Even if some of them get more that get more than three coons, you'd still be in the runoff from and from what I've seen here tonight, you have a good chance at winning the cup. I know that little Anne had sent the coon in the air that same the, the same as she had the ghost coon. I walked over and knelt down by her side. The thing I wanted to say to her, I couldn't for the knot in my throat, but I'm sure she would understand. When he says that he has a, a knot in his throat, it's like he wants to, he's choked up. He, he's full of emotions. Uh, he probably wants to let out and cry, but he has um, the other men around him. He's just um, holding it all in. As we came up to the campground, the hunters came out from their tents and gathered around us. The judge held up three big coon hides. There was a rear, uh, there, was, there was a roar from the crowd. One man said, that was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. What a beautiful sight, Grandpa asked. The last, last night, those little coon hounds brought that coon right through the camp, the judge said. We figured they didn't want, they did when we heard the noise. Laughing, the man said, we heard them when they ran up the other side of the river. Way up here, they crossed over. We could tell that they were coming back and we, we dozed all of our fires and sure enough, they came right through camp. Those little hounds were, weren't 50 yards from behind the coons running side by side. Boy, they were picking them up and laying them down and bawling every time their feet touched the ground. I'll tell you, it was the prettiest sight I've ever saw. Prettiest sight I ever saw. When the judges started ta uh, telling about the last little coon little Ann had treed, I took my dogs over to our tent and fed them and watered them. After they had their fill, I gave them a, a good rub down with a piece of gunny, gunny sack. Taking them out to the buggy, I tied them up. I stood and watched while they twisted around in the hay making their beds. That day, I tried to get some sleep in our tent, but, but the soaking grandpa had taken in the river had given him a cold, causing him to snore. I never heard such a racket in all my life. I've had, I'd have sworn he rattled uh, the paper sack in our, in our grocery boxes. Taking a blanket, I went out to my dogs. Little Ann had wiggled up as close to old Dan as she could. Prying them apart, I laid down between them and fell asleep. That night of eliminations turned out like the second night. None of the judges turned in more than two hides. That day, about noon, the owners of the winning team and I were called to the conference with the head judge. He said, gentlemen, the eliminations are over. Only three sets of hounds are left for the runoff. The winners of tonight's hunt will receive the golden cup. There, if there is a tie for the championship, naturally there would be another runoff. He, sh we shook, he shook hands with each other, each, each of us, and wished us good luck. Tension began to build up in the camp. Here and there, hunters were standing in small groups talking. Others could be seen in and out of their tents with rolls of money in their hands. Grandpa was the busiest one of all. His voice could be heard all, all over the camp. Men were looking, looking at me and talking in a low tone. I, sh I strutted like a turkey gobbler. That evening, while we were having supper, I, uh, a hunter dropped by. He had a small box in his hand. Smiling, he said, everyone has agreed that we should have a jackpot for the winner. I've been picked to do the collecting. Grandpa said, you may as well leave it here now. Looking at me, the hunter said, son, I think almost every man in this campground is hoping you win it. But it's not going to be easy. You're going to be again, up against four of the finest hounds there are. Turning to my father, he said, did you, know that, that, did you know the two big walker hounds have won four gold cups? Very seriously, Papa said. You know, I have two mules down at my place. One is almost as big as a barn. The other one isn't much bigger than a jack rabbit, but the little mule can, can outpull the big one every time. Smiling, the hunter turned, turned to leave, he said, could uh, you could be right? Papa asked me again where I thought we should start hunting. I I had been thinking about this all day. I said, "You remember we, where we jumped the last coon in the swamp?" Papa said, "Yes." Well, that way I figured the more more than one coon lives in that swamp. I said, "It's a good place for them, as there are a lot of crawfish and minnows in the in the in the potholes. If a hound jumps one there, he has a good chance to tree him." 
Papa asked why. It's a long way back to the river and about the same distance to the mountains, I said. Either way, he runs, the dog has plenty, the dog can get plenty close to him. So he, uh, and, and so he would take them to a tree. That evening, we climbed into Grandpa's buggy and headed for the swamp. It was dark by the time we reached it. Grandpa handed Papa his gun saying, you're, you're getting to be a pretty good shot with this thing. I hope I, get a sh I hope I get to shoot it a lot tonight, Papa said. Under my breath, I said, I do too. After untying the ropes for my dogs, I held on to their collars for a minute, pulling them close. I knelt down and whispered, this is the last night. I know you'll do your best. They seemed to understand and tugged at, at their collars. When I turned to let them loose, they started for the timber. Just as they reached the dark shallows, shadows, they stopped, turned around, and, stare, and stared straight at me for an instant. The judge saw their strange action. Laying, laying a hand on my shoulder, he asked, what did they say, son? I said nothing that anyone could understand, but I felt that they know this hunt is important. They know it, it just as well as you and I. It was little Ann who found the trail. Before the echo of her sharp cry had died away, old Dan Deep's voice floated out into the swamp. Well, let's go, Papa said eagerly. No, let's wait a minute, I said. Wait, why, Grandpa asked. To see, what's, what, to see which way he's going to run, I said. The coon broke out of the swamp and headed for the river. Listening to my dogs, I could tell that they were close to him. I said to Papa, I don't think he'll ever make it to the river. They're right on his heels now. By the time he circled the swamp, they were bawling tree. They, bawling, they were bawling tree. The judge said, boy, that was fast. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. Looking at me, he smiled and nodded his head. Papa and I knew I had the judge... I had judged the coon perfectly. He didn't have to reach the river or the mountains. My dogs had treed the coon in a tall ash which stood about 50 yards from the river. I knew that 50 yards had saved us a good hour because he could have pulled a trick after trick and if had gotten in the if he had, had if he had gotten in the water. We spied the coon on the toppest branch at the crack of the gun he ran out for the limb and jumped. He landed in an old in an, in an old he landed in an in an old fallen treetop the he scooted through it coming out from the other side he ran for the river the tangled mass of limbs slowed my dogs and they all but tore tore the treetop apart getting out of it the coon was just one step ahead to them as they reached the river we heard them hit the water running off we stood and watched the fight the coon was at home in the river he, he crawled up on old Dan's head, trying to force him under before he could do it. Little Ann reached up and pulled him off. In a scared voice, Papa said, the water looks deep to me. Maybe you have better, better call them off, the judge said. This, that's a big coon and, he'll, and he could drown one of them easily in the deep water. Call them off, I said. Why, you couldn't whip them off with a stick. There's sure no use for anyone to get scared. They, they know exactly what they're doing. I've seen this more times than one, more times than one. Papa, Grandpa was scared and excited. He was jumping up and down, whooping and hollering. Papa raised his gun to aim. I jumped and grabbed his arm. Don't do that, I yelled. You're sure, you sure to hit one of my dogs. Round, round and round in the deep water, the fight went on. The coon climbed on old Dan's head and sank his teeth in one of his other, ten, uh, of his tender ears. Old Dan bawled with pain. Little Ann swam in and caught one of the coon's hind legs with her mouth. She tried hard to pull him off. The three disappeared under the water. I held my breath. The water churned and boiled. All three came to the top at the same time. The coon was between the bank where we were standing, uh, standing on and my dogs. He swam towards us. They caught him against, they caught him again just as he reached shore. He fought his way free. He fought his way free and ran to a large sacramore. Old Dan caught him just as he started up. I knew this was the end of the fight. After all, it, after it was all over and the coon had been skinned, Grandpa said, "I hope we don't have to to go through that again tonight." For a while, I sure thought your dogs were goners. The judge said, "Well, have you well have you ever seen that? Look over there." Old Dan was standing perfectly still with his eyes closed and head hanging down. Little Ann was licking his cuts, his cut and bleeding ear.
She always does that. I said, if you'll watch when she gets done with him, she'll do the same. He'll do the same for her. We stood and watched until they, they had finished doctoring each other. Then trotted side by side, they disappeared into the darkness. We followed along, stopping now and then to listen. And that is the end of chapter 16. Uh, I'm telling you guys, it's each chapter is so beautiful. Each chapter holds its own, like just excitement. Um, I love how um, the new people that are meeting Billy know that he is just as determined as his dog. I swear these dogs and uh, Billy are a perfect match. They hold the same characteristics, determined, independent, yet um, they have this bond, okay? So we just finished chapter 16. We have four more chapters left of Where the Red Fern Grows. I hope you're enjoying each chapter. I hope you're really soaking it in, um, taking um, certain uh, lines in with a deep meaning. Um, it's very exciting, very, very exciting. Um, Billy, I believe, is now 14, maybe 15 years old, and he is just um, full of experiences. So remember, please answer those three questions I submit when I upload my videos. Any questions, let me know. Stay up to date. And I will see you tomorrow for chapter 17 of Where the Red Fern Grows.